live. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us. This is Crit and Miss, and you are watching Critical Conversations, the only live stream on Twitch that isn't quite as necessary as the title would suggest. Um, I've got one hell of a show planned for you guys tonight. I have a, a very special guest, um, Evan Winston from DrawingsAndDragons.com. How are you, man? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing great, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. And hey, everyone out there who's watching, now or in the future, uh, you know, I'm really super excited to be here, super excited to see where this conversation takes us. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing to have you here. I know there's a bit of a, a time difference from, uh, from where you are to where I am. So, uh, guys, if you're watching, if you don't already know, um, I am in uh, Townsville, in North Queensland, Australia, which is like the, uh, the tropics of, uh, of Australia. And Evan, where are you streaming from? I'm from, uh, streaming from San Francisco, California, in the U.S. Uh, it's about three in the morning here, so uh, I'm trying to keep my voice as quiet as I can so I don't wake my toddler, but uh, uh, yeah. How old are Yeah, working well, right? around a toddler is always fun. How many kids you got? Just the one, just the one. She's, uh, she's, a, she's a full-on three-nager now, though. Oh, we're in the, we're in the same position. I can, I can hear my three-nager in the bath behind me at the moment, and uh, I'm betting some people watching the stream can probably hear and bang these toys around as well at the moment, so... I uh, apologize about that, guys. Um, but hey, this is Quick and Miss. Uh, you can't come here expecting the, uh, the highest quality uh, professional um, sort of audio. That's not what we do here. We're, uh, we're chilled, we're relaxed. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what you come here for. That's, uh, that's what you get. Um, so for those who haven't seen uh, a previous episode of Critical Conversations, uh, you don't know what it is, you don't know what it's about, I would highly recommend going back, checking out our YouTube, watching the other episodes. But uh, in a nutshell, it's really just about being able to sit down with some you know, people in the Dungeons and & Dragons and tabletop role-playing community, showcasing uh, what they do, what their experiences are, and... Um, you know, especially content creators uh, in the community, and it's uh, it's an excuse for me to to sit down and and, and meet awesome new people and uh, have a have a chat basically. So, um, for those people who are watching um, who don't know about your work, Evan, uh, what is it that you do? Yeah, that's a oof, that's a loaded question. Um, I do a, I do a lot of things, but as as far as uh, Dungeons and Dragons goes specifically, um, I'm an artist, and it, as far as most things go, specifically, I'm an artist. Maybe it's not that loaded. Um, I came up as an illustrator, animator, and uh, worked as a visual development artist for a while, um, and I discovered that you know. Dungeons and Dragons was a very, very fitting community for me. It was, it was a very welcoming community. It was a very um, open community. Uh, I, I've always, always followed the, um, you know, the art, the, the, the more thematic trappings of Dungeons and Dragons, the, the sword and sorcery mm -hmm. kind of stuff. That, that's been, I've been all about that from the very, very beginning. But I kind of resisted it for a while um and so coming full circle back to the D, D community and finding clients and players and just just a a community of people that appreciate the work that i do and and who whose tables i get to improve with you know some custom artwork of their characters or their homebrew or their uh npcs or creatures it's 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 always very very rewarding to see that mm -hmm. um you know, these days I do a lot of art direction for small studios working on 5e content. Uh, but that's 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 really the gist of it, you know. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I, I can relate to what you're saying. Um, I, I was a bit the same. I was really into fantasy and sci-fi things when I was a bit younger. And then I guess um, you go through high school and maybe your priorities change a little bit. I don't know why, but um, they shifted a little bit and maybe I shied a little bit away from what it was that actually made me happy and, and what I enjoyed. Okay. Thinking that I would, uh, uh, I could have a better image 
uh, in society if I if I shied away from those things. But it wasn't until I got older and and more sort of secure and in, in myself and look to be quite frank, gave less of a shit about what other people thought about me that I could really dive back into into you know fantasy and and, and sci-fi and you know all this kind of nerdy stuff and it's been so like so different to what i expected because the community itself is amazing like they're all very welcoming like i said i've had no one talk down on me like having you come on the on the on the channel i mean we never even met before i just uh, sent you a message and you're like yeah I'll, I'll be happy to jump on i mean that doesn't happen yeah, in in just about any other sort of um Field, you know what I mean? Everyone's so encouraging toward each other. Everyone's trying to build each other up. But it's also, I found that I at first thought that admitting that I was playing Dungeons and Dragons and doing all this kind of nerdy stuff, like people would um, be sort of averse to that. So I started yeah. telling people that I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons. But the uh, but the reaction to that has been quite the opposite of what I thought it would be. At the very worst, you might get a raised eyebrow. Or, like what the hell is that they don't know what we're talking about but 90 percent of the time people will be like oh yeah i was interested in dungeon and dragons but didn't know how to get into it or you know never got the time to do it that's that's mostly yeah. the response that i get do you have sort of like the same experience yeah i'd say so i mean we, we live in a pretty unique time where D, &D is cool again um uh n not that it was never not cool but you know it it, it now has the uh it, it's now it's now okay to be into D and D uh, in a way that it hasn't been for a while, or maybe never was, but yeah, I get I get exactly the same thing. You know, I've I've met plenty of people who uh, encountered a really tough barrier for entry into playing D and D, and really those barriers are starting to fall with social media and ease of access to a lot of materials, other players playing online. Technology has has technology and and a lot of the you know five E mechanics have made just access to a table uh, of people you've never met easier than it's ever been and, and it's it's that much easier to just jump into a game and really explore and you're i've i've rarely found anybody who has been um unwelcoming of newcomers or people who aren't so familiar with how the whole thing works and you know the the various companies that produce tabletop role playing games they're getting a, they're getting on board with it as well they're making their games more accessible to new players so obviously you got the fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons is obviously a lot it's a lot less crunchy than the original Dungeons and Dragons systems for it's easier for people to pick up and play uh, I myself I've only actually ever played uh, fifth edition um, not gonna lie uh, i haven't been playing yeah, well. for, for that long yet see so and and fifth edition is is so much more um accessible for people to play so they're making it easier for people to jump in but when you still like when you dive into the really crunchy mechanics of fifth edition all that stuff from the earlier editions is still there like there's there's as much um mechanics and tools as you want so you can just skim the surface and play the surface level game, or you can get into really crunchy mechanics if you want. Yeah, While the as you strength, want or if you want is important there. Yeah, as you want, and that's that's what that's really what uh, what D and D and, and tabletop role playing games it's all about. It's about playing the game that you want to play, or you know your group of friends sitting at the table want to play. It's it's not the same thing for everyone, and. Mm -hmm. I just think it's amazing um, that a guy with as little experience as I have in uh, in D and D, I start this channel and people are engaging with it. I, you, like you, you touched on this earlier, it's like so rewarding knowing that people are engaging with something that you're creating. And I also one one big thing about the channel is like making a community and bringing people together. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And and I can appreciate that, you know, it's it's very much the same for me. I do not play a lot. I have not I don't have a lot of experience actually playing yep. as an open player in uh you know, in a lot of tables. I've never DM'd. Uh although that sounds like it would be horrible fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, not gonna lie, it is uh it is a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's also extremely rewarding. Um 
Yeah, there's there's really um, there's really tense moments when you get the players hanging on your every word. That's when you know you know you got them. That's what I do it for. That's that's awesome. I mean, it, it's amazing to see a really good DM at work. And if anything, that's being exposed to a really confident and capable DM is what really pulled me back into the world of D and D more than more than the table of players I was with itself, or certainly not the the one shot. It was it was a holiday themed one shot, so it wasn't it wasn't anything to write home about, but. The DM just really, really sold it. When they, for lack when they of a get your hooks, yeah. When they, when when you get your hooks, I like you know you got them when you can get a physical reaction out of your players. Um, so yeah. I think it's episode six point five of Out of the Abyss. Uh, Mark Hillman, who's in the chat at the moment, he's a player in one of that. Um, I put them in a pretty tough situation. Um, spoiler alert: his character may have taken a little bit of a dive. Um, and um, one of the other players, Toby, like everything was on the line on his next dice roll. And he says to me, my hands are shaking. I was like, yes, gotcha. I got you, you son of a bitch. My job's done, you know? And that's- oh, um, Trauma, that's, that's the key. I've done it now. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the thing about um, Dungeon Dragons and tabletop role-playing games that is so fascinating and so interesting to me is they become the character that they're playing you know what i mean it becomes like an extension of them there's no other game that you play um where people will say let, let's say for instance you're playing monopoly you don't say i'm going to move myself six bases you know what i mean um yeah but in dungeon and dragons you say i'm going to do this when you get lost in the game you don't even realize you're doing it you say i'm going to do this and it's sort of like you become that character. It's like an extension of yourself and you actually have an emotional reaction to what's happening. You don't really get that too much in video games. Um, yeah, it's, it's different. It's it's a totally different medium. And you know what, it is hard to draw that line, but the full emotional and physical buy-in you get from a good D&D table, you're absolutely right. There's nothing like it. So I would never describe my tables as being good tables, but I'd say they're average, maybe just above average every now and then, depending on what kind of mood I'm right. in. I definitely have great players, though, not going to lie. Um, in fact, tomorrow night is the first time that I will be playing um, a system other than 5th edition. Ooh. So, ooh, looking forward to that. Yeah, we have um, <clears throat> our Call of Cthulhu stream tomorrow night, which is... Uh, we did the session zero a couple of weeks ago, and tomorrow night's going to be episode one of that. So I, I don't know how it's going to go. Um, I love Call of Cthulhu. I've listened to a couple of podcasts uh, from the from the Glass Cannon, um, and I like the idea of the system. And when we were doing character creation, I could already start to feel the character, as it were. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to that one. Have you ever played any other systems other than uh, D and D or? Yeah, so I, I played a lot of Shadowrun back in the day, um, and I've played a bit of the Masquerade Vampire. Uh, I'm a big fan, big fan of them. But honestly, I'm a big fan of them for the world building aspects, the role playing aspects, and less so the mechanics of, you know, fifth edition D and D, which just you know, again, I haven't played the earlier editions, but it really makes sense. And every time I discover something new, it's just like, oh, of course, that's that's a brilliant way to do it. And I know I, there are detractors or people who are going to disagree with me, but it it something about the way the system is constructed feels like it make it makes sense. It works, and it's it is welcoming to new players, and that's a that's a big deal for me. Yeah. Well, you, you do touch on a good point. The thing, the thing with Dungeons and Dragons is, um, you you play the hero. You're sort of like a superhero, and you're going out and you're doing all these things. But when you're playing other systems, I haven't played Vampire the Masquerade, um, or I don't really know much about it. I know of it, but I don't really know much about the system or anything like that. But the thing that drew drew me about Call of Cthulhu is it's um, you're much more vulnerable as opposed to Dungeons and Dragons, and that vulnerability sort of makes you have to think ahead and think creatively and really be 
um, listening to what the the keeper uh, is saying. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? You have to hang on every word. You need those details because otherwise you're just not going to survive. So that's what uh, that's what interested me about that. But I love uh, I love Dungeons and Dragons just for that. You know, you're you're a badass. It's like a power fantasy. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it is, and there's, there's a plus and minus to that. But yeah, I, I, I get that. I really do. I don't get to be a badass um, in real life anymore. So if I can, uh, if I can sit here in my little man cave and pretend to be a badass uh, with a group of uh, grown grown people pretending to be wizards, I'm absolutely going to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell um, me about it. So, um, in regards to your work in sort of like um, uh, illustrations and um, animation and all that kind of stuff, how did you how did you sort of get started? What drew you into that? Oh well, let me let me preface that by saying I've had a very weird career path. Um, <laughs> I like weird. Very weird. That's what we do here. We do weird. I've done I've done a lot of stuff. I was um, I was a, a cook and eventually a pastry chef for a while, uh, a number of a number of years. I ended up uh, being a foreign trade investment uh, consultant for the government of Catalonia for a while, huh. um, just before the uh, the vote to secede. After which I was not that anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, uh, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of things. And now, um, well, let, let me back up a little bit. For about eight years there, I was making my income primarily from being an artist. Um, and this kind of came about after uh, I had done a lot of government work, a lot of... Uh, I, I had I had basically given up on being a, a pastry chef because it was too hard of a lifestyle with which to raise a family um and especially to you know make it in the in the san francisco bay area it is an expensive city yeah uh, so i i kind of put all that behind me and uh i decided i didn't, didn't want to do the government related work anymore wait, wait, let, uh, let, so let, me just, started... let me get this straight i just want to i just want to clear something yeah. up so being the pastry being the pastry chef was too uh, too stressful. So you thought, hey, yeah. what should I do? Work for the government? <laughs> was that less stressful? It was, it was actually, you know, wow. government works. It was not fun. But, uh, you know, the benefits are good. Some of the stability is good. Um, but, you know, I put all of that behind me and I, I started digging up my old, um, my old art supplies, literally sketchbooks and pencils. And I just started getting back into it. Uh, you know, I had drawn a lot as a child, and much like a lot of the things that actually interest me, I abandoned them for uh, a big chunk of my life come high school, when when apparently I got too cool for school. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I started getting back into it. And, um, yeah, I just built a, a design and illustration business from the ground up. Um, I trained as an animator, basically self-taught animator illustrator and uh i worked my way into getting work out of a lot of the animation studios either uh here in the bay area or down in la anywhere i could uh and not just animation i was also doing some of the boring stuff like uh marketing collateral for tech companies stuff like that uh but a lot of fun stuff a lot of children's books uh animated features visual development for for animation stuff like that uh, and it 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 was a whole new a whole world that I basically didn't even know existed. It was like someone said to me, you know, all those, all the the fun sketches and doodles you were into and as a kid, you can make money doing that. Uh, it just it just never occurred to me that it was a viable career path. So I developed that, and uh, I did that for uh, as I said about eight years. Um, and then my my then girlfriend eventually got married we got married uh now we have a three-year-old as i said um and just before my three-year-old was born i basically realized that as much as i love what i do we need some additional stability and yep. some additional benefits so uh now i actually have a day job as um a senior software engineer for linkedin and that's what i've done for about three years coincides perfectly with the birth of my daughter fortunately 
Um, but I still cultivate any contracts that I can as, as an art director for studios that could use that as a service. Uh, as an artist, uh, in terms of personal commissions for people who are interested in my work. Uh, and I work on personal projects as much as I can. No, that's, Does uh, that answer your question? I don't even remember what the question was. Anymore. No, that uh, that pretty much uh, that nails it uh, spot on. That is one hell of a career path. It's quite a quite a roller coaster ride. So, um, pastry chef, investment officer, uh, artist and illustrator, software engineer. Look. I kind of feel like I'm underqualified at the moment um, because yeah. I mean, what do I do? I'm a I'm, I'm a fitter. Um, I don't, like I work at uh, I work for Toyota at the moment as a as a pre delivery fitter. That's what I do. I I don't really have any qualifications really. Oh, I do. I, I'm a security guard as well, but obviously that's uh, doesn't really count for anything because just about anyone can be a security guard here. Um, there is no such thing as underqualified. I mean, it's really just a question of who's who's gatekeeping you out of uh, what you want to do or where you want to be. Yeah, and like uh, on Twitch, it's really about personality. Um, and yeah. if nothing else, then I at least have uh, some personality to, to showcase to the uh, to the world, whether or not it's something that should be showcased. I'll leave that up to the historians to, to decide. I'm right. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's exactly it. Hey, let's uh, let's face it. I'm not the most questionable channel on Twitch, not by far. So, I've always got that. Um, but yeah, that's 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 one hell of a career path, and it's just I, I I'm so jealous of people uh, like yourself who get to do something that they really love doing um, and they feel really passionate about and they can do that for a living I'm really hoping that with support of people such as yourself that maybe I can get there one day maybe I could be sitting here broadcasting live on twitch for six hours a day or something like that <laughs> maybe not I feel like I would lose my voice after the first couple of hours I already struggle with just four hours of uh, streaming d d no, I hope so too. I, I will say that when, you know, I, I found a good balance where I, I have a job that supports the lifestyle I want for my family and I get to continue doing what I love, you know, at least, at least to some degree. Uh, I will say that if you get to a point where you are doing what you love and depending on it to live and all of that jazz, uh, it, it does become a horse of a different color yes uh, you know I, I i have clear memories of you know sitting down on the couch to watch a movie and i'm like this movie's two and a half hours how much money could i have made in that time <laughs> if i weren't watching this movie um you know so, so there's definitely a danger yeah. to being that self-employed driven creative uh, or content creator but you know if if you find that groove then more power to you yeah i i feel you i'm i'm not earning a dime off what i'm doing at the moment uh it's it's actually costing me money to do this uh but i enjoy doing it so i keep doing it but i'm already in that sort of mindset um it, it can yep. be a little bit dangerous where um sometimes i have to just force myself to be like no don't work on the channel right now because I can always think of ways that I can improve the channel and I'm doing it constantly. If you look at all the previous streams that I put up on YouTube, you'll see every single every single one, the, um, the presentation is different because I've been constantly updating it. I feel like I'm beginning to settle on a look that I'm kind of, uh, kind of enjoying, but who knows where I'll be next week. I'll be one o'clock in the morning sitting here with uh, bloodshot eyes tapping away at the computer <laughs> updating the uh, the general look but that's that's just the kind of person I am um, when I do something I can't seem to do it just a little bit I have to do all of it <laughs> I have to die yeah. um, and I, I feel like there's a lot of people in the D&D community that sort of have that same um, characteristic same same trait where they can't just do D, D a little bit they have to do all of D, D. they have to broadcast themselves with podcasts and, and twitch streams and they have to have every book and they have to have played every class and character it's like this it's this addictive thing and i think um mod brew in the chat can probably uh probably weigh in on this as well it's bitten him really bad where there's been a couple of uh a couple of times where he's like I got to take a step back and, and focus on my job a little bit. And I'm the same way, even when I'm at work all day today, not going to lie. 
I had a, an earpiece in and I was listening to um, tabletop role-playing game podcasts. All yeah. Day. I do it all the time. Sometimes it's probably not the best for me. I should probably put it down. But I do that to, to gain inspiration for my own channel. So I, I see it as a little bit as it's pleasure and work at the same time. Um, yeah, I, I hear you and I get it. You know, with a lot of... Um... With a number of clients that I have, you know, if I work for their studio as an art director, it does mean being very involved with a lot of their their stuff, a lot of their creative direction, and usually it just means artists and yeah. the art that they're producing. But but anytime I'll see something that I have any an iota of a, a opinion or input to offer on, I need to, I really need to catch myself and prevent myself from getting. So super involved in something yeah. outside my review because I just like, I, I just want to get in there. I just wanted, okay, this is something I have to say, or this is something I've thought of. I think it might help, maybe not take it with a grain of salt, but um, it's really dangerous for me to just try to get my fingers in all the pies and uh, I can quickly burn out in that way. It's super easy to get like completely yeah. sucked into where it just becomes your, your everything and your, you're neglecting some other things that you probably should be doing like mostly yeah. yourself like look at my beard i need to shave but i haven't had time to shave because i've been too busy um you know preparing for different uh different campaigns and updating the look of uh, of streams and blah, blah 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 and talking to other people and whatnot so probably should take a little bit of time for myself um maybe a little bit of a a, a beauty treatment get rid of some of these lines who knows um in regards to um, sort of like uh, what companies and, and projects um, that you've worked on, is there anything that you can share? Like um, where can people sort of find your work or, or what have you worked on that you, you think people would be or should know about? You've, you've probably seen uh, some of my work or well, let me let me rephrase. So what I primarily work on is uh, the pre visualization stage of a property. Um, so you're not likely to see a character that I animated, yep. uh, since most characters are animated in 3D now, and, and I'm a, a 2D artist. But uh, what you are likely to see is a character whose you know body locomotion and expression I designed and uh, sort of felt out and explored, or a character whose body proportions and just whole whole visual look I designed. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you might have seen some of my work in. As far as uh, as far as gaming specifically goes, there are I've lost a lot of work yep. to failed, failed products, um, to sunset products, or uh, a lot of abandoned projects that then were picked up by another company and haven't been uh, given the green light again, haven't been rebooted. Yep. As it were, and when that happens, artists, uh, a lot of the writers involved, they, they they lose a lot of that work to the NDA and the power of the NDA. That's happened to me a lot. Um, in particular, as as pertaining to a a very big title related to D and D, that's in in the in the zeitgeist right now. But um, that that happens a lot. <laughs> so I I you know, there's a lot of stuff that. I can't share. As for um, what I am super excited about is, you know, we I, I'm, I've got some cool stuff coming out, some new books coming out this year. I'm working with one company called uh, Gold Mountain Games that is producing, you know, a whole new 5e setting. Uh, that's super exciting. You know, that the I'm really really impressed with how the writers are creating these new species, these new subclasses. That are really intended to elevate the game and take it to a whole new level. Um, a lot of uh, ship combat mechanics. There's a, it's an island-based setting, so there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting stuff there that I personally have not encountered before. And so it's really fun to be a part of bringing that world to life, basically from the ground up. Um, so that's really fun. No, uh, yeah. Outside of that, you might have seen a, a children's book or something that I illustrated out there. You, you might have seen a commercial I worked on, something like that. Probably not here. Uh, probably not in town. Yeah, yeah, there's that. Look it up. Who knows? Um, th that is something that I wanted to touch on uh, when you mentioned that um, that you don't you don't really work on on three D art, but you do like the um, 
I, I don't know is concept art the right word i don't know but like yeah the yeah. the like the, the posture of characters and all that kind of stuff yeah. and it is actually something that i wanted to mention during the stream is you are amazing at that uh what i find about artwork is, is it's uh, it's as much about what is implied as much as it is about what you see and that really comes from like when you're talking about like character art like body language um so i could describe the the picture that's on 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 uh on the channel right now on the stream for people to to look at i could describe it but i could never really um in my own words really describe like the attitude that i'm getting from the character you know what i mean the, the look in their eyes and the look in their face yeah, what, what you are getting from the character sorry i'd love to hear what attitude you are getting from the character a little bit um, not to put you this guy kind of looks a little bit like um, he's listening to someone talk um, and he already knows what they're talking about, but he's just sort of, uh, he's just, um, what's the right word? Um, he's just entertaining them, as it were. That's what I sort of get like, get from that, like, I already know what you're talking about. I'm smarter than you, just stop talking. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty on point. <laughs> See, there you go. Um, amazing artist. Um, if you can convey that message, like I, I have done a little bit of the sketching artwork myself in the past, but I'm really, really bad at it. Um, so I don't, I'm not going <laughs> to ever show anyone anything that I've worked on. I could, could, I could never convey messages like that in the artwork that I make. It is only what you see on the piece of paper. Whereas the artwork that you do, there's more than just what's on the piece of paper. Like, obviously the artwork is fantastic, but it's the messages that you convey to the art that makes it just that much better. And that's why I think art is so very important for like D&D &D, um, and, and players for their characters. If they can describe that to you and then you make this piece of artwork and it's exactly what they had in their head, and it has that sort of character and that flavor that they were imagining. Um, I imagine that probably just rocks people's worlds when you when you send it through to them, and they're like, "That's that's exactly it. Like you you captured that character perfectly." Well, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, it really means a lot to me. Um, and you know, I hope so. I hope so. I think I think my work makes some people happy, and that really that if I find that really rewarding. Um, I will say it's definitely true, you know, concept art as it is, um, a lot of it is about what you don't see. And, I, you know, I spend a lot of time online or in person trying to help um, up and coming artists, whether it's professionally as an art director or just on a, on a mentorship basis. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to get them to, to deepen their skills in a way that goes beyond, you know, learning how to draw a, a tree better, yep. you know, how to draw a more accurate scene. Uh, it's, 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 there's so much more uh, that needs to happen beneath the surface in order to really capture that energy um, that I think goes so overlooked in a lot of concept art education or concept art pedagogy out there. Uh, I mean, it's the kind of thing I can go on forever about, but, uh, you know, it, it, it means a lot to me that, that, that you see that. I hope other people see that a little bit. And I, I certainly hope that other artists who want to pursue this as a, uh, as a career uh, learn to look for that as well. So there's, there's a bit of like um, a bit of distance between us. Um, so I imagine um, the entry pathways are a little bit different for where you are for people here in Townsville, but for, you know, people watching internationally, if you had like a piece of advice to give someone who was like a, like a budding artist or someone who wanted to get into illustration or character art or something like that. Um, if you had to give them one piece of advice, what would that be? Only one piece of advice. Uh, I mean, I, I, you can make a case to bump it up to three pieces of advice uh, if you want. Oh, that's, uh, that is tough. Uh, I, I think the most important piece of advice is, um, you know, learn, learn how to receive criticism, um, because it's not always critical, um, or it doesn't have to be critical. I mean, there's bad criticism, there's bad critique, yeah. but if you, if you can learn how to take good criticism, if you can seek out good criticism, if you can engage in good criticism, maybe learn how to give it yourself. You know, you don't have to be 
uh, and Ian McKay, you don't have to be the world's best artist in order to in order to have a voice and give critique in the right setting. Uh, and learning how to give that critique, learning how to take that critique is the number one thing that can help improve your skills as an artist or your professional acumen as a professional artist. All right. All right. Well, that pretty much, um, that just cancels my um, ability to, to apply for artistry in the future. Um, I can't take critique. Someone says, hey, you're DMing wrong. I say, shut the hell up. And I mute their microphone and we just move on. Uh, that's, bad. that's bad critique. <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's really good advice. Um, but I, and, and it's, I think it's sort of applicable to a lot of different areas as well, is you sort of have to, uh, I just, of course, I am very open to um, people offering suggestions about how I can improve things. Um, obviously, it's like you've got to leave a little bit of your ego at the door. So that's not just good advice for, for people wanting to, to get into you know, illustration and all that stuff kind of thing. It's a good advice for just about everyone. And I think it especially yeah. applies for, for DMs. Mm. I, yeah, I bet it does. DMs, writers, artists, and it doesn't matter what level you're at either. I mean, you, you never reach a point where you're like, all right, I've done it. <laughs> I'm where I want to be. Um, no, there's a, everyone always has blind spots. There's always more to learn, and the imposter syndrome never, never goes away, ever. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so. not gonna lie. I'm I'm always watching other people's streams. I'm always looking at the content that other people are producing, and I'm reading things. I'm looking things um, because I know full well that I, I I'm not the best at everything. Um, so. I look for inspiration uh, where I can find it. And I always, always encourage my players to be open with their critique. Don't just say to me, yeah, it was a great session. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Be like, yeah, it was a great session, but I didn't like this particular thing. This was, uh, this was not so great. Maybe you could do it differently this time like this. And I, I might take that on board or I might not take that on board, but either way, I'm not gonna be upset about it. I'm gonna be more upset if I don't learn. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a that's a very important very important point. Um, anything else that uh, that illustrators should know? Or uh, yeah, I mean, don't neglect the fundamentals. Yep. There's a lot of there's a, there's a trend in um, it's become a lot easier to uh, jump right into uh, the concept art world because of social media and how easy it is to get your work out there. Yep. Um, and what, what that's happened, what's happening is a lot of younger artists are just kind of jumping straight into the kind of art that they love. So they'll jump straight into manga art, for instance, or they'll jump straight into comic art. And that's fantastic. And you know what, if, if it makes you happy and it's what you want to do and where you want to be, you do you. Um, but in terms of developing as an artist and developing as a professional, there are some things to consider. And, uh, you know, those things are really don't neglect the fundamentals because that that manga character design, that manga art that you're super in love with, it isn't just like a simplification of the real world. It's not just sim a simplified drawing style. It's a super designed, super tight, very decision based um stylistic choices of solving visual problems yep. that has culminated in the the thing you see before you and respond so well to and so trying to like emulate that without the fundamentals underlying all of that is, is like making a copy of a copy of a copy mm. you know what i mean yes yeah, so you don't really understand the decisions that were made to get to that point in the first place yeah i exactly uh, i get that yeah and it's uh it's a uh, again like it's applicable to all the things don't um you, you got to do the hard work you got to do the hard yards you can't just uh you can't just jump in the ring with mike tyson you know what i mean yeah you've got to uh you got to spend a few years knocking some pads around before you get in there otherwise it's uh it's gonna hurt yeah ten thousand bad drawings for every good one yeah i heard I, someone say i did twenty thousand bad drawings and i was like nope not for me um but uh I, I feel like as, as far as like art is concerned, I'm, I'm better at taking things and 
arranging them in ways that I find visually pleasing um, as opposed to well I guess I'm just not that really that creative let's <laughs> let's be uh, let's be honest but um, maybe I'm a little bit more creative with my with my wordplay as opposed to like visually so I guess um, that's something that I could be proud of I suppose right? all creativity man you're you're a successful DM who, who uh, you know creates a a content creation stream within a or focused on a, a shared world of of uh, fictional narrative development. I mean, you, you create these stories every time you host a, a table. Mm. That's a huge, huge creative pressure and burden, uh, and a huge job that I I don't envy. I mean, I kind of do because it seems like horrible fun, as I said, but I I couldn't do that. I could not manage a table in the way that you do. Yeah, uh, there's a, there's a lot to it behind the scenes, but uh, like I said, it's something that I really enjoy. And I really like what's better than being able to sit down with uh, with a group of friends and you know pretending uh, to slay a dragon. I'll tell you what, nothing, nothing is better than that at all. Um, so it's just about nine o'clock here. Um, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go for a uh, a quick couple minutes break, uh, and we'll come back and we'll uh, we'll continue the conversations. We'll talk about a couple of couple of other things. Um, people watching live, um, if you could please stick with us, I'd really really appreciate it. Uh, for those people watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, this break will be much shorter for you, and it's pretty much not going to be any break. But before we go, there is one thing that I wanted to talk about, and I'll brush up again on this uh, before the end of the stream, and that is that right there. So, um, good friend of mine, um, Royce from the Dungeon Roos. Uh, you might know them from the Dungeon Roos podcast, which you can find on Spotify and iTunes and everywhere else where you find uh, podcasts. Um, they currently have a Wild Beyond the Witchlight campaign. Um, they also uh, organize and run uh, in real life games um, just down the road from where I live, actually. Um, and they, uh, well, he rather, is trying to raise a little bit of money for the Soldier On uh, initiative, which is a, a not-for-profit organization which uh, raises money for um, currently serving and ex-serving uh, Australian Defence Force members. Um, and he is going to be dyeing his hair, or not his hair, rather his beard hair, pink. But there's a caveat. We need to get to $3,000 before the 7th of October. So if you want to see the head DM from the Dungeon Roos dye his beard pink, you need to get on there and you need to donate right now. The details for that are up on the screen. Um, you can uh, you can scan that um, barcode thingy and that'll take you to their GoFundMe page. I'll also be sharing the details for that on my Discord and various social medias get on there donate because i mean look at all that gray he needs to cover it up somehow um so dyeing it pink is going to be the best way to do that ladies and gentlemen if you want to see the head dm from the dungeon ruse dye his beard pink get on there donate right now and the money goes to a fantastic cause of course townsville my hometown is a big um um sort of barracks town um, a lot of uh, defense force personnel here. So, and my brothers in the in the defense force, and I have a lot of friends in the defense force, and I know the struggles that they go through. So these sorts of things are fantastic for that. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, we will go for a short rest. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Stick with us. We're going to be talking more things RPG, tabletop role playing games, and Dungeons and Dragons in just a moment. And we. Uh, back ladies and gentlemen uh, for those people who stuck with us uh, through the short rest uh, thank you very much I appreciate it um, uh, I, of course I am returning with uh, artist Evan Winston thanks for uh, thanks for joining us man yeah thanks for having me I'm having fun so far um, yeah amazing uh, so where did we leave off um, all right, let's, uh, you know what, let's talk a little bit more about, um, you know, 
D and D and tabletop role playing games themselves, like the mechanics and all that kind of stuff. Can I ask you a couple of questions about like your experiences with uh, tabletop RPGs and Dungeons and Dragons and all that kind of stuff? We'll get a little bit of an idea of like what your experiences are and what your opinions are on things. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Cool. All right, let's dive into it. So first up, you did mention that you played a little bit of Vampire the Masquerade. Yeah. How long have you been doing that for? Has that been gone for a while or sort of new? Uh, I mean, I've had it off, yeah, for a while, I'd say. A couple of years at least. All right, so for someone like me, I've never, I've never listened to a podcast, never watched anything, never played Vampire the Masquerade. I know my good friends over at the... Uh, Townsville Tabletop Guild. Um, absolutely, Alicia, who's running my Call of Cthulhu game tomorrow night. She also runs Vampire the Masquerade, and one of my players, Grace, really loves the system, but I don't know anything about it. So, if you had to like explain it to a complete beginner, how would you do that? Like, what's it about? Well, obviously, it's about vampires. It's not going to be about um, uh, sausage dogs, but like, what is Vampire the Masquerade? So the setting, um, and, and much like D&D, you know, the actual campaign adventure can be anything under the sun. Uh, no, no pun intended. But uh, the setting itself is based on the, this conceit of what's called the masquerade, uh, which is basically the facade that all of the vampire factions of the world maintain in order to keep themselves hidden from human society. Um, so there are things like vampire hunters, of course, but most people out there do not know vampires exist, and that is a result of the masquerade. And so the the core tenant, the core drive for all of these vampire vampire factions is maintain the masquerade, and so it's anathema to break it. That's kind of the the big undercurrent of the whole setting. As for the system. Um, its main difference from something like D and D is that it's even more invested, at least in my opinion, in role playing, and less so in um, combat. You know, it, it is it is very very much about role playing and finding mechanics to uh, to facilitate a lot more granular role playing and politicking mm -hmm. between these these either hoity toity vampire factions or uh, some of the salt of the earth on dark underbelly of of these cities. Uh, there, there, you know, there, there's a lot of um, social mechanics and role playing mechanics and relationship mechanics that uh, really push a lot of the adventure. And that's sort of. Um... That sort of king at the moment is like is role play. I know a lot of people they they really enjoy podcasts or shows like Critical Role, where like it's mostly role play and and, and going back and forth and, and doing all that kind of stuff. Full disclosure, I've, I haven't actually watched uh, Critical Role. I've watched a little bit of it. It's not mm -hmm. my thing. I know other people enjoy it. I really enjoy uh, role play as well. I love what. Uh, when I'm playing, I love being able to to role play with other people and bounce off of each other. So, no, it it, it piques my interest. Um, though I will admit, I'm probably not the best person when it comes to to politics and all that kind of stuff. Do you find that when people play um, Masquerade, is a little bit like other RPGs? If if the Masquerade, uh, so to speak, is something that, that shouldn't be broken, is that the one thing that people go out to try and do immediately when they're playing the game? Uh, no, actually, I, I'd say that's really, a lot of times it's what you're trying to prevent. Oh, you know, okay. it's it's the it's the MacGuffin that you somehow need to stop. Um, but, you know, it goes both ways. Like, there's always, there's always a I don't want to say a problem player, but a player who goes against the grain a little bit or who <laughs> deliberately tries to break the narrative. Yep. Uh, we all yeah, know that can is. happen. We all know one of those. Um, don't watch uh, Tales from the Rogue's Light Tavern where, where Mark DMs, because I've played on that a couple of times. And I may or may not be that person. But um, I'll leave that up to people to decide for themselves. And and you've been a player in, in Vampire the Masquerade. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, maybe about a character that you've played? 
Like, what, uh, when you play a character, what's your sort of thing? Like, what do you like playing? Because I know everyone has sort of like a, like a type. I like playing really wild and ridiculous characters. For instance, my character for tomorrow night is a male prostitute in the 1920s. So I, I go for the cool. wildest, thing, <laughs> wildest thing that I can find. So do you have a, a type of character that you like to, to play? Yeah, for sure. I mean, when it comes to vampire, the, I think my two favorite I just, with vampire, you know, it really falls down into like what faction you belong to, rather than what class or or subclass you choose to pursue. I mean, there are obviously more more layers of mechanics than that, but um, you know, for me, I get drawn to either the Gangrel or the Malkavian, and so Gangrel are is this faction that is um, much closer to animals. In a way, their bloodline is very is very like wolf heavy or bat heavy, um, and so they're they're loners. They often you know uh, they hunt on on their own or they have very very pack like behavior when they're together, things like that. And then there's the Malkavians, which are basically just just crazy. Um, they have they have a lot of crazy in their bloodline, and so they're known for speaking in complete non sequiturs uh, just because they're they're hearing literal voices in their head and having a conversation with, you know, somebody who's not there or something else that's not there. Um, so I like the the surprise that you know the Malkavian can bring, and I like the, I think the the Gangrel is kind of more my speed in terms of playing a, a, a more predictable character. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna lie, um, the Mal Malkavian is that right? Am I pronouncing that correct? Yeah, that's right. That yeah, that's right it. Up my alley. <laughs> I played a character who, um, in the previous episode of Tales from the Rogue's Light Tavern, who um, could hear voices in bread. So that <laughs> was that was his thing. <laughs> would hold a piece of bread. I love it. Uh, he think he th he thought he could hear um, the word of the gods in uh, in pieces of bread, um, and that sort of drove him to become a serial killer. And that was uh, that was kind of his thing. Uh, a lot of fun to play. I don't think Mark liked it very much, but uh, I certainly enjoyed it. I think the people watching enjoyed it too. So, and that's what it's really about. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you had to pick one, um, like tabletop role playing experience, like what's what's right up there? What like sticks out for you? Like what experience I've had that sticks yeah. out for me? Yeah, is that oh, been I a mean... moment that stands out above all the others, or? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it would probably come back to that very first one, <clears throat> which happened again way too late in my life. But that very, very first holiday themed one shot that was actually <laughs> sponsored by my workplace at the time. And oh, it was wow. just me. And yeah, it was it was a very small like holiday party and they paid for a professional DM to come in. And it was me, and uh, I think it was four or five coworkers, and and it was just, it was just like a light went on in my head, or something something snapped in there, and it was like, oh, this is what it's all about. This is this is the magic that can happen. Um, y you know, D and D is this big has been this big white whale in my life in terms of work that I wanted to do, but also like fun that I wanted to have, community that I wanted to engage in. And it's always been that, even when I didn't even realize it. And so that moment is is a big one for me. That sort of that that click when you realize, hey, this is this is this was it. This is what I was looking for. Um, yeah, that's really cool. Um, it's it's cool that your work did that. I've um, I don't think I've ever heard about anything like that here, where I'm from. Um, I, I would love it if uh, if my work. Uh, did something like that um, I so I could uh, I could show everyone just um, how far down the rabbit hole I actually am um, you should volunteer your, your services as I, a DM and I, feel like, I feel like there would be so few people um, because I, I work in a in a um, like a trade industry what we call a trade here and um, tradies in Australia they're not known for their um, their love of mathematics and sophistication mm -hmm. and um, um, you know communication <laughs> and stuff like that but hey could be interesting uh, I'd definitely be willing to give it a go I have uh, I have no qualms about um, showcasing myself to people um, well, you never... 
So, hey, hey, maybe we can make it happen. My my boss generally tends to be more interested in, you know, gym stuff. But yeah, who knows? Yeah, maybe maybe sometime in the future, if he realizes that, um, uh, what is it? Stranger Things made the D and D popular again. Um, well, you know, it was always popular, but it's brought it a little bit more into the uh, into the public conscience. Um, and what about? Um, like recommendations um in regards to other sort of um uh media books movies games tv shows is there anything that uh that you've seen that you feel other people should watch as well or Ooh, that, that that's a that's a long list so i, I mean for my part i'm i'm super into um certain forms of animation that's that's just my thing. So that that's definitely something that informs me a lot. Outside of that, uh, I read a lot of sci-fi. I, I I don't play so many video games anymore, but I try to where I can. I feel you. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, with 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 TV, there's just there's just so much nowadays oh. that it's really hard to keep up. We are really living in a in a golden age of uh, of TV shows at the moment, as far as I'm concerned. There's uh, there was a, a long time there when I I really didn't really watch anything on TV. Like the shows that I would watch are few and far between. Yeah. I feel like um, the emergence of like uh, Game of Thrones, for instance, has sort of turns yeah. what you expect from a TV show on its head and now we get some really some really cool stuff that i'm into it in fact i think we're, oh, yeah. i feel like we're in a renaissance for nerds such as myself because we have so much stuff to choose from we're really spoiled for choice um and a new D, D movie coming out finally you looking forward to that or have you watched the trailer what do you reckon i've watched the trailer i i think it's fine <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be fun. I'm yeah. sure it's going to be enjoyable. I'm sure there's reason to look forward to it. I'm not um, pinning all of my hopes for the future of the franchise on it. I, uh, so I cautiously optimistic is a good way to, yeah. to phrase how I feel about it. I feel you. I feel, I, like, I feel worst case scenario, it's a, it's a bit of fun. And, you know, fun, forgettable fun, really. Um but I'm not going to I'm not gonna like cancel it out or anything like that. There are some things that make me like make me nervous uh, when I watch it, particularly. And tell me if you feel the same way. But I feel like they're trying to cram maybe one too many iconic D and D things in, into one yeah. movie that it could become a little bit of a mess. Because just off the top of my head, from what I saw on the trailer, what do you got? You got Despacer Beast. You've got multiple types of dragons. You've got a gelatinous cube uh what am i missing oh uh, a mimic um obviously a uh, paladin barbarian bard there's so many iconic things that i feel like they're maybe sure. trying to jam too much into one movie i fully agree with that it, it is also hard to determine how indicative of the actual film that trailer is yes you know yes. The trailers are also a heavily produced thing so who knows how it's gonna feel yeah, trailers I, I, are I, very, very, very difficult these days. You have to really take them with a grain of salt because sometimes you watch a trailer and you're like, "Oh, that's going to be garbage," um, and then you watch it and I'm like, "Wow, that they really undersold it." Um, I actually I found myself avoiding trailers a little bit more these days um, than I used to. Back when I was when I was younger, I was like, I'd eat it up. I remember when Lord of the Rings uh, was coming out, um, I would. You know wait for seven to eight hours to download the trailer um so, <laughs> so i could watch like uh 60 seconds of uh of footage from a from a lord of the rings movie um because back then you know the internet wasn't quite what it is these days yeah. um so <laughs> i would literally spend all night watching a, a little bar you had the little loading bar uh which would slowly fill up and once it got like a certain amount i would watch that amount till it till it finished and i'll be okay now i have to wait and then once it got a little bit further i would bring it back and watch the whole thing again and i'd sit there all night until i could watch the whole thing it was ridiculous yeah but these really days i i i feel like sometimes they maybe show a little bit too much they showcase a bit oh, too for much sure. trailers. 
Yeah. And I don't know if that's... I don't know if that's because they're actually showing more in the trailers or if it's just because I am getting older and uh, am able to... Oh, I've gone to all the pictures. I'm able to sort of pick up on more information or not. I don't know which one it is. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a fair bit of both. Um, you know, d definitely with the, the growth of things like Netflix and services like that, I think the the amount of just spoiler tangential content that makes it into these trailers has gotten ridiculous and uh, um I'm, I'm starting it's to also weird expectation of... I, I start to appreciate the the feeling of watching something without having seen a trailer or knowing something about it beforehand yeah. like i used to like yeah you know, i'd want all that information beforehand now i don't know if you've watched the new um predator movie prey I, just the other night i it, like i hadn't even thought about it i just i was sitting there i was doing some work on the channel i'm like i'm i'm completely burnt out i can't do this anymore so i loaded up um a game on the computer and then i sat there for about 30 seconds staring at the screen i'm like i can't even do this <laughs> my brain's not working <laughs> so then i sat down in front of the tv which is something that i never do because i'm always working on the channel and I turned on the TV and I turned on the whatever it was and it came out and I was like, oh, look at that. I remember hearing something about that and I put it on and I really enjoyed it. And I think I enjoyed yeah, it all I, because I knew nothing about it. Yeah, I, I agree. It came out of nowhere for me. I was like, oh, there's a new Predator movie. I feel almost like I, it was sent I, out to know. die, but it didn't. No, it was it was a huge surprise. I was very happy with it. Well, I'm uh, I'm glad we agree on that as well. That's uh, that's amazing. I know it's a little bit of a controversial uh, topic at the moment. Some people are not so happy with it, but um, you know what? We'll let them be them. I enjoyed it, and that's uh, that's all that matters for me. Um, yeah. In terms of like tabletop RPGs, like we 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 touched on this earlier. There's like this. Um, this whole new world that's sort of emerging at the moment with like um you know online gaming it's sort of broadened the horizons for like way more people now if you're living in like a sort of remote area you can still find people to play with because the internet sort of gives you that access to to other players but there's still something to be said for like sitting down at a table with um you know physical dice Physical yeah. minis, um, that one right there from uh, from Frost Minis, by the way. Check out Frost Minis; they're amazing. There's something to be said for that. So, what do you prefer? Do you prefer to sit down and, and play games online, like if you get the chance to play games? I know you're extremely busy. Or would you prefer to sit down at a table with uh, with people and and play with like the tactile sort of maps and stuff like that? I think all else being equal, I'd prefer to sit at a table, yep. but that that's just, it just doesn't happen anymore no. for me. Yeah. No, it just doesn't happen. Uh, and I think that we, I, I crossed the line somewhere after which I had something in me just decided, yeah, this is not going to be possible anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel you. And it's like, there's a, there's a lot to it. When I first started playing a few years ago with, um, with Luke Archard, uh, from, big game small pieces uh he was my first dm he's now dming white plume mountain on the channel we ran the first episode of that on monday sorry i keep plugging my streams here but it's just uh it's something that i do just check that one out as well it's a lot of fun uh he was my original dm and i would uh i would every what was it i think it was thursday every thursday uh it was at his place at like 6 45 so i would finish work at like 4 30 and i'd get home at like 5 30 and i have to get changed and all that kind of stuff and like pack my bag with all my dice and like books and minis and all that kind of stuff and like like beeline it down to his place which is all the way on the other side uh of townsville which i imagine for you guys probably isn't very far distance but for me it is um and you know unpack and then sit down and then you got your character sheets you're gonna set that all up and you, you know, da, 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 da. I much prefer playing in person, same as you, but there's something to be said to just sit down with D&D Beyond and above yeah. TT and just like, it's so much easier. And it's cool too, because like, 
if the players are like, oh, I, I want them to go do this, and but they decide, no, I want to go over there. If you're playing in real life, you, you've sort of got to have grid paper and draw out a map and, and do all this kind of stuff. But with the virtual tabletop, I can just go online, quickly find a map and go, boop, boop, there you are. It's available for them to play. So there is something to be said for that. But yeah, I agree. I much prefer to sit down in person. This, yeah, well, it makes whispers a lot easier too. Yeah, whispers and this like uh, body language that you miss out on when you're when you're playing online. That's really yeah. the thing that I miss because you know obviously so much of communication is body language and you don't really get that through the camera so much. I do try to yeah. be as expressive as I can, and that's why I always use camera so people can see me, and I encourage other people to do the same thing, but. You just you can't convey the message quite as well. Yeah. Um, it would be cool, and it is something that we've explored in the past, potentially, like sitting down, um, like in a in a real life game, and sort of recording that for the show. But just the amount of work that goes into setting that up, I don't know if I can make it happen. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot more overhead with something like that. Yeah, there is. There's a there's a lot of work. Maybe it's something that I can that I can do in the future. But for the time being, it's um, we're going to be sticking with uh, with the way that we do it. Um, yeah, it works. And and sort of like building on top of that, like the whole new online system has opened up uh, Dungeons and Dragons and, and tabletop role playing games to a whole new audience that didn't have access to it before. So there's a lot of people that are looking to get into D and D. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that I've met when I've said, Oh, I play D and D that are like, they don't even know where to start. Yeah. Um, like there's no real, um, like starting place. It's, it's not very, um, well described beginner friendly. yeah beginner friendly that's right and i know there are beginner stuff but it's it's a very alien concept for a lot of people like they don't really understand the concept of it so if you had maybe some advice or some tips for a new new gamer uh someone who's interested in dungeons and dragons doesn't know where to start or maybe someone who's bought themselves um the starter set or something like that bought themselves some some dice what would your recommend recommendations be for someone beginning tabletop games? I mean, I'd, I'd say don't be afraid to reach out to people and, and admit that you're a beginner. You know, you don't definitely don't try to show up at a table and, and bullshit your way into uh, pretending you're you know you've got ten years of experience playing. Uh, you know, own up to it because people are gonna people are gonna be welcoming. People are gonna help you. People are gonna help teach you what you need to know and. It's not it's not the end of the world if it's immersion breaking for a session or two to help bring you up to speed. Um, you know, I, I also I think it can be really helpful to listen to streams and, and understand how people play and really just kind of get the flow of the whole thing. That's what definitely helped me in the early days. Um, and, you know, don't be afraid of not creating your own character the first time around. You know, maybe find a pre-made one or ask somebody to make one for you or help you make one because that the character creation process especially in 5e is is a real big um ball of complexity that can drive some people away yeah i i, I agree and i think uh to, to build on that a little bit i think it's important to to not really have your mind set on one particular thing uh yeah. I, I i i feel like that was a little bit uh, a bit of maybe my mistake when I was first playing uh, games, and Luke can probably tell you about that. About that, I um, I wasn't really sure what a, what what I wanted from my character because I thought I had to know beforehand, and I, I didn't really yeah. know what to do with them. Make your character have an idea um, of what they are and, and where they're from, and, and all this kind of stuff, and then start the game. And if it doesn't work, let it go. Just that's not part of the game. It's it's not part of the character. It's all good. For instance, um, I am a player on the Valiant Odyssey's uh, Twitch stream. I play Praxilius. One of my original character concepts for Praxilius was that he was a heavy drinker. Um, that was going to be like part of his character. Um, 
we started playing we're up to episode i want to say eight or something like that in that one i've sort of just let that go because it didn't really work with the campaign that we were playing the people that i was playing with and the dm and all that kind of stuff so you have to be ready to sort of go with the flow and adapt with what works don't try and make something that doesn't work work don't fit square pegs into round holes um <laughs> so to speak and they have a really 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 big hammer yeah and, and i actually find a lot of people um expect or want their their full character arc to be pre-written in some way yeah. like they know that they don't they, they, they know that they don't actually know how the campaign is going to progress but they they have this vision of how their character is going to go and it it can feel um can feel a bit wooden to try and make that arc that they pre-envision conform to how things actually go at the table so it's more like just let go of that and let your character evolve uh you know let let things be unexpected and be surprising let your character make mistakes you know don't try to min max every single statistic good advice uh you know uh th those kind of flaws are what make things interesting and make for some fun dramatic moments yeah i think i've heard to it refer to as failing up in dungeon and dragons i, I don't really i don't feel like there's any real there's not really a wrong thing to do. There's not really a, a failure. Yes, you can make a decision that gets a character killed or something like that, but you can always make another character and come in. And even if you're very emotionally tied to a character and they die, that's not necessarily a failure. I find that to be no. like, it's part of the success. It's part of what makes the story. It's emergent storytelling is so important uh, yeah. in Dungeons and Dragons like if you have one particular idea and you sort of pursue that like railroad yourself in that direction you're missing out on so many opportunities or potential opportunities because you're not focused on that and that comes back to that yes and sort of um mentality that I try to encourage in my players and I try to keep in the back of my mind as well is not to be like, especially as a DM, you know, to be like, no, that's not a thing. I try and go, yes, and this is how it'll work. Um, and Mod Brew was just uh, in the chat, just um, a little bit of advice that he gives for new players is to watch a season two of Critical Role. There you go. Big Critical Good Role. Good one. Um, they are, of course, like, they're at the top of their game when it comes to, yeah. to yes and and uh role playing and bouncing off each other and all that kind of stuff but that does come with the caveat don't expect your first game of D&D &D to be like that but i think there's a lot of people that have uh have sort of gone over that better than i could ever ever say um just go in with an open mind i think really is what it comes down to i took a long winded road to to get there but i think i got there in the end yeah, I've heard that advice a lot. Don't don't expect your table to play like uh, an episode of Critical Role. That's a, that's a very very high bar, full of uh, professional voice actors, yes. people who have uh, a heavily heavily produced show, and it's wonderful stuff. Don't get me wrong. It's just it's not. It's probably not going to be reflective of your your usual D and D experience. That's right, and I feel like the less you try and attain it the more you attain it it's really it's ridiculous but the less you try and do it the the, the closer you are because the more natural you'll yeah. be and the more comfortable you are and that's really what it's all about it's about being comfortable um when it comes to Im improvisation is about being comfortable with the people that you're talking to and like trust trust that what you're saying they're going to work with in a, in a way that is positive and then hand it back to you and then back back and forth and so on and, and so forth oral writing yeah. so, followed up with a comment know what D, D you want to play and that's that's a that's a really good one too because you, know, you, you do need to find the right group you need yes. to find the right dm um, um a, a good example of that for instance is i'm currently running oh, I love it. Um, this campaign right here Ooh, yeah. there we go out of the abyss yeah. now this is a very particular type of campaign 
when a lot of people think about Dungeons and Dragons, especially if they're fans of Critical Role, they imagine themselves cajoling in a tavern before they go climbing a mountain to raid a dragon's um, horde or something like that. You're not going to do that in this campaign, all right? It's it's just it's not part of the campaign as written, unless your you know DM wants to change things up and add it in there. But there's a lot of different types of games to play, so have a have a good understanding of what type of game you want to play, what what type of campaign you want to play. Do you want to play high fantasy? Do you want to play something with a little bit more um, like horror and survival elements, which is big in Out of the Abyss? Do you want to play something um, that is more wacky and fun and just weird? Um, then maybe go with uh, with the with the new content, with the Spelljammer content, because yep. you, that's what that's all about. It's about wacky space pirates, space whales. Um, what are they called? Um, murder comets. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Oh, thank you for joining us, uh, All Things Fantasy. I uh, appreciate it, man. Um, just so you know, just so everyone knows in the chat, in fact, uh, just for joining us and leaving a message in the chat, you go into the draw to win uh, an art commission by that guy right there, Evan Winston himself. Um, and I will be announcing the winner of that, hopefully tomorrow night for our... Uh, Call of Cthulhu Shadows of Despair um, stream. So, of course, I will get in touch with whoever wins and, and, and we'll go over that sort of stuff. I'll get your contact details. But, um, yeah, you can win a free art commission by by Evan. Um, ooh, yeah, uh, it's almost... Uh, it's, it's, it's 20 to 10 now uh, here. Um, before we go, we should talk about... Where can people find your work if they want to get in touch with you? Um, they want to get a, maybe an art commission or something like that or whatever. Where can they find you? Uh, so, I mean, I have a, a trade name that I've used called Irrelevant Evan. So any anything Irrelevant Evan on social media is going to be me. Um, I feel drawings like and drawing advertisement, by the way. I feel like you're far from irrelevant, but we'll, that's a I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that. I've had that handle a long time. Um, drawingsanddragons.com, which you'll see at the top of the screen page, the the stream page, is uh, my commission site. So where you can find a lot of artwork that is very much focused on TTRPG commissions. Yep. Um, you'll also find some DM partnership work, things like that. Um, Gold Mountain Games is one of the bigger clients that I'm working with now in building a full new world and setting with them from the ground up. So I think their social media presence is just starting to get up and running. But if you keep an eye out, they're going to be leaking more content over the course of the next few months. And it's really exciting to see that come to life. You know, it'd be really fun. Uh, it'd be really fun if I could uh, if I could have a chat with, uh, with, the, with the guys from Gold Mountain Games as well. Maybe we, yeah. could, uh, we could drop some, some juicy bits of uh, content here on the channel. That'd be fun. Yeah. I'd love to do that. I'd love to put you in touch with them. That'd be great, you know, especially our writing team. Any, any, anybody on that? We got a couple of writers who actually professionally write for for LARPs. Oh, so <laughs> they're handling a lot of the adventure modules. It, it's uh, it's just super cool stuff that they're coming up with. And the new species in particular, I'm really loving. I'm really loving that. Uh, you know, we're we're really trying to explore some different like cultural influences for a lot of this world. It's really fun to bring it bring it to life from the ground up. Um, so yeah, those are the big ones now. If if anybody's interested in more product design, software design kind of stuff, you can also find me at irrelevant evancom dot com. But uh, don't go there; it's boring. Oh, now I kind of want to go there. I want to do a stream where I just go there and look at everything. We'll just like dive in real deep. We'll just, just see what we can find. Now it's all good. Um, Amazing. So, guys, make sure uh, you check out drawingsanddragons.com. Uh, you can find all of Evan Winston's uh, contact details there if you want to get some, some character art done up. Um, 
if you missed the stream, you still want to go on the draw over the next 24 hours, uh, make sure you jump on our Discord, go to the drawingsanddragons.com. Um, text channel, just leave a message in there and you'll go into the draw. You don't have to do anything specific, just chuck a message in there and you, you'll go into the draw. Uh, and then join us for tomorrow night's stream of Call of Cthulhu where I'll be announcing the winner. There is another thing that I wanted to announce as well for those people in the chat. Mud, this is for you, All Things Fantasy, this is for you. We've been um, working on a little bit of something uh, in the background. So we use um, special cards for our live streams that, uh, that people can buy with the with the crit coin and then the players can um, redeem them during games so things like advantage uh, guidance health potions all that kind of stuff and one of them is the wild magic cards now the way the wild magic cards are supposed to work is the DM can when someone casts a spell draw one of those cards and play it we roll on the wild magic surge table it has been a little bit underwhelming so far so I was like hmm how can I add a little bit more spice to the Wild Magic Surge table? Well, I know, I'll just crumple it up, throw it in the bin, and we'll come up with a whole new one. So I am currently in the works for making new Wild Magic cards. Now, for those people who are already uh, members of the Critverse, uh, everyone who has appeared in a previous stream, I am going to get you to make one of these cards. Um, and then later on, I'm going to be releasing them those to the to those to the wider audience as well for other people to to write out these cards. And then when we play the Wild Magic Surge cards, I'm going to be drawing one of those cards out of the list. I'm going to be reading it out. So your name, what the effect of that Wild Magic Surge is going to be, and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to get involved with that, just make sure you stick with us. When I have a little bit more information, I'll be dropping that. So I think that's going to be. It's gonna be wild. Um, I may be shooting myself uh, in the foot here a little bit because I feel like people are really gonna take advantage of that. But, you know, hopefully I'll have a little bit of time to, to proofread them. Um, other than that, I spoke about it just before we went on a break, but we should cover it again. Uh, Royce uh, from the Dungeon Ruse is doing a little bit of a, a fundraiser for uh, Soldier On which is a non-profit organization here in Australia that provides assistance to uh, serving and ex-serving Australian Defence Force members. And he, if we reach the, the goal, which is $3,000 by the 7th of October, he is going to dye that glorious beard pink. So if you want to see the head DM from the Dungeon Roost podcast dye his beard pink, Make sure you jump on there right now. Um, you can find all of their details uh, on, on their social medias as well as on Spotify and iTunes and all that kind of stuff. Donate some money to that and I will be throwing up pictures on our Discord and I'll be throwing up pictures on our Facebook and everything. So it's, it's definitely worthwhile. And it's also a great cause because I have family members in the ADF. I have a lot of friends in the ADF, so it would be amazing if you uh, if you were to donate a little bit of money to that. Have I missed anything? Um, no, I think I've covered everything. Is there anything else that you uh, you wanted to share with the Critverse before we call it a night, Evan? Uh, no, I think I've covered everything as well. I will say that. Um... You know, if anyone has a, a homebrew creature monster encounter that they're super fond of and want to see professionally worked up and maybe include in the, included in the book. I think GMG, Gold Mountain Games, is holding a, a submission pipeline right now where you can, you know, submit any idea you'd like and um, and potentially get it professionally statted, painted, written up, and, you know, with your permission included in the final settings book. Um, but either way, it's a it's a fun contest, a fun way to get some some free material and some uh, see some of your ideas come to life. So, if anyone wants to participate in that, you can just check out Gold Mountain Games, and uh, you'll find the details there. Let me just have a quick look so I can chuck that in the chat. Gold Mountain Games. Yeah, only see what a professional I am. I'm so professional. I had this pre-planned. Um, 
Oh, no, Here, I'll link you the Facebook page oh, for yes. uh, games. Do that, because I think there's a lot of people uh, on the Discord and, and in the Critverse who would love to make a few um, submissions to that, myself included. Maybe I can come up with something fun. I do have a little bit of a weird... Uh, um, what's it? Um, creativity, so... Yeah, that's, that's it for me, though. You know, uh, I, I I just want to say again, thank you so much for having me on here. And uh, everybody else, you now know where to find me if you if you ever want to either just talk about art or get some art made or anything of the above, any of the above. Uh, you know, I, I love working on this stuff. It's really a, a dream of mine to be able to make people's characters or ideas come to life. And D&D is, is very, very near and dear to my heart in that way. And yeah, check out uh, check out drawingsdragons.com for the phenomenal artwork by Evan Winston. And hey, who knows? Maybe uh, maybe you'll see Evan again in a in a future stream. Maybe an episode of Good Conversations. Maybe uh, maybe he goes absolutely crazy and agrees to join us on one of our gaming streams as well. Who knows? Um, I am starting to look at bringing people from all over the world. So having someone uh, from California, yeah. 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 So having someone from California would be uh, you would be the first um, in, in one of my games as a player. That would be uh, that would be really cool. So um, at that, guys, uh, it is almost uh, ten o'clock here. Uh, make sure you join us again tomorrow night for Call of Cthulhu. But other than that, um, we love you all. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you're watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, make sure you check. Have a great night or morning, everybody, and we'll uh, see you all next time. Thanks, all. Goodbye.